Hi, I'm Marcelino D'Ambrosio, and we're going to be talking a little bit more today about the norms of Catholic doctrine. In this, the fourth lesson, we're going to finish talking about the inerrancy of Scripture, we're going to cover the Gospels, and then we're going to get into hermeneutics, and that is the interpretation of Scripture and some of the ground rules whereby we do that. First of all, in the last class, we talked about Scripture as being inerrant, without error. That doesn't mean that there are not scientific or historical inaccuracies that have nothing to do with salvation that may be present in the, in the Bible. At least that's the Catholic perspective, and it's very, I think, important to try to uh, understand that clearly so as not to set up a, a conflict between science on the one hand and, and God's Word and the Bible on the other. That's what the fundamentalist and controversy was, was really about. And we don't need to get into that. We can uphold the authority and the inerrancy, the lack of error in Scripture. What we're talking about when we talk about inerrancy is lack of error about God and about salvation, about our relationship with God. That is the truth that God is trying to communicate to us through the human words and the human authors of Scripture. But let me say something about inerrancy. One thing you have to keep in mind is it presumes that the Old Testament is provisional revelation. In other words, Old Testament words themselves cannot be taken out of the context of the New Testament and said to be infallible words. There are many things in the Old Testament that are no longer guides to our moral life, and there are many thoughts in the Old Testament that in and of themselves are not accurate. For example, there are many places in the Old Testament where someone says there is no life after death that the dead cannot praise the Lord. But we can interpret that in light of the New Testament and say the spiritually dead can't praise Him, or those in hell can't praise Him perhaps, but we do know that literally speaking, yes, those who die still live, that there is life after death. So we have to interpret the Old Testament in light of the New, and inerrancy presumes that. It also presumes that each individual scripture is interpreted in the light of all the other scriptures. That's called the principle of totality. God is speaking one unified word through Scripture. So you can't just take one isolated statement of Scripture and interpret it out of context and try to defend your opinion talking about Scripture's inerrancy. When, you, when Jesus says, the Father and I are one, well, that can't be interpreted wrongly, taken out of context to mean that Jesus and the Father are the same person. That's what some heretics have done in the past. And there's many, many examples of that. So the Scripture needs to be interpreted First of all, Old Testament in light of New, and each individual text in light of the whole. That is called the Analogia Fidei, or the Analogy of Faith. That's an important theological concept, and I want you to make sure those of you taking it for credit get it. The Analogy of Faith means that truth is one, and Scripture reflects that one truth. And so every individual statement of Scripture must be harmonized with the whole. It, it can't have conflicting meanings with other scriptures. Okay, let's talk about the Gospels for a minute. Because the Gospels are where the rubber meet the road for us Christians, in that the Gospels tell us about the life, about the words, about the teaching, about the, about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Savior. And that's the central event of the history of mankind. That, that's the central event of Revelation right there. So we need to understand that the Gospels, the four Gospels, have a very privileged place in Scripture. Look at the way Catholics and many Christians, even with their body language, show the centrality and the preeminence of the Gospels. In church on Sunday, we Catholics sit and listen to the readings from the Old Testament and the readings from Paul and Acts and Revelation. But when the Gospels are read, we stand. We sing Alleluia. Sometimes the book of the Gospels is a different book, and that's something that's very traditional coming from the early days of the church. Sometimes incense is burned before the Gospels. And that all is in honor. Uh, that, that honor that is showed there, the honor to the Gospels, it just shows the preeminence of these four compositions inspired by God. Uh, many times, for Protestants, the center of the Scriptures is Romans, or Romans 1, 17, the dogma of grace, salvation by grace alone. For Catholics, it's clearly the, the central place of the Scriptures is the Paschal narrative, the narrative of Jesus' death, and resurrection. That is the center of the scriptures for Orthodox uh, Christians uh, from the East and for Catholics as well, and many, many of the liturgical Protestant churches like the Lutheran Church as well. Okay, let's talk. Uh, so Jesus' death and resurrection is the center of the scriptures. 
fundamentally. That event and the, and the telling of that event is the center. Now, the, the one big question is, how reliable are the Gospels in telling us about Jesus? How reliable are they? Uh, doubts were raised maybe about 200 years ago that, you know, these stories, it was discovered through analysis, the new tools of literary analysis, that the gospel writings, you know, were, were maybe put together in some circumstances from some earlier sources. Some discrepancies are found between the four gospels and certain details. And so, you know, doubt began to arise that the, that the gospels really represented the truth about Christ and about what he taught and what he did. And I want to just talk about uh, something th to help us understand the progression of the gospel tradition. The gospel, the, what happened to Jesus in, th in his death and resurrection, his public ministry, happened 27 to 30 AD. That was the time frame we're talking about. And from what we can tell right now, none of the four gospels were written immediately after four, you know, 30 AD. In fact, it would seem that the, the earliest date for the gospel, any of the Gospels would be, maybe be in the 60s. So we're talking 30, 35, maybe 40 years between the Gospels as we know them in their final written form and the actual events that they, and the words that they re relate. Obviously, there was no video camera back then to record the exact image of what Jesus did, and there was no audio tapes to record what he said. So there was a period of time when what he did and what he said was carried forward in the minds and the hearts of the eyewitnesses, in their stories, in their words. And so there are three stages of the gospel tradition. And this is something that's mentioned, actually, in Dei Verbum 18 through 19. There was a, a little document that was written right before Dei Verbum, right before the Vatican Council. It's on the historical truth of the gospels. And that document from the Pontifical Biblical Commission is an important document. And I'm just going to share you the, the insights of that document. The first level of the gospel tradition is what Jesus actually said and did literally. And in Latin, that's called the ipsissima verba Jesu. And that was a, a famous phrase that people argued over, scholars argued over that in the earlier part of the 20th century. So the actual words and deeds of Jesus. The second stage of the tradition is when those words and deeds of Jesus were passed on orally in the preaching of the apostles. In the, in the Sunday services of Christians, where the, the stories were told of the parables and Jesus' teaching, and, um, and people preached on them. Okay, that happened, that oral tradition went on for, for decades before the Gospels were written. And we know now it would seem that the Gospels are written at different times. The Gospel of John traditionally is seen to be the last Gospel, and that was something that the fathers of the church said. It's something that scholars today seem to believe as they go, there's a few people who dissent, think that John's early, but very minority opinion. You know, most think that John is in the 90s, where Mark is, you know, or Matthew, there are differences of opinion here. Matthew and Mark are earlier in the 60s or early 70s. So you know, there's a long period of time where there is material that is passed on from one person to another. Most of the apostles die, it would seem, uh, around the 60s. Certainly Paul and Peter die in the 60s uh, at the hands of Nero Caesar in Rome. And, and we know James died earlier. It's recounted in, in Acts when James died. So some of, the, some of the carrying forward of the stories is done by non-apostles, sometimes non-eyewitnesses. Luke, the writer of the, of the uh, third gospel, is not an eyewitness. He received the stories. He, passed, he puts them in written form, but he didn't see that stuff himself. So th there's, there's a period of time when the gospel tradition is passed on. And, and it's passed on and shaped by its retelling. If anyone has ever told a story over and over again of a great event in the history of your family, uh, you know that it's natural for, to pattern of, when you tell an event over and over again for it to get into a certain pattern. And there's some details that are not relevant, you leave them out. There are other things you highlight. Every once in a while there may be a little bit of an embellishment that actually makes the story better, that brings a certain person to life a little more. It may not be exactly true historically, but it represents the person very well or the, the situation very well. There's lots of things that happen like that in the retelling of a story over and over again or the retelling of words. The third stage is when people, the, the four inspired authors, actually sat down and wrote out the Gospels in their final form. And uh, there may have been several drafts of some of the Gospels. Luke says he had some other sources that he was working from. Uh, many people think Luke and, and Matthew had different sources they were working from. John, he seems to have been edited 
Just the literary evidence shows some editing and an epilogue tacked on at the end. So anyway, in the final written form, that's the third stage of the gospel tradition. Now, where is God in all this? Is the Holy Spirit inspiring the actual words and deeds of Jesus? I don't think anyone would doubt that. Is the Holy Spirit inspiring the, the four canonical gospel writers as they write their final recension, their final draft? Well, Christians believe that. Well, how about that period in the middle? Was God guiding that period? We don't know the names of the people necessarily who passed on that tradition, but could not the Holy Spirit have been there guiding that process, shaping of the stories and patterning the stories and the words? I think so. Um, and, and what the church guarantees is not that stage three, the written gospels, are word for word exactly equal to stage one, what Jesus actually said and did word for word, but rather that stage three faithfully represents Jesus, his life and his teaching, the truth about who he is, what he taught, what he did. Not necessarily the details. In fact, the fathers of the church knew, without any modern scholarly apparatus, it was common sense, that the gospel writers didn't care about preserving accurate sequence of events in Jesus' ministry. When did Jesus clean out the temple? You know, did he do it at the beginning of his ministry, as it is in John, or at the end of his ministry, as it is with the synoptics? Question is, does that matter for our salvation? No. So the fact is, what does it mean that he cleaned out the temple? That's the important thing. There's lots of things like that, you know, in terms of sequence of events. The important thing is, what did he teach? What did he do? What was the meaning of his life and his ministry and his miracles? That's the important thing. And the church guarantees that this is reliable. That's the important thing for us to understand. Why are there four Gospels? I think that's a, an important question that people need to just con confront. There have been people in the history of Christianity that have seen a problem with multiple Gospels. There's this mentality that you see in the early church, like in a heretic called Marcion. Marcion in the first century, um, who began his own sect, he thought that multiple Gospels means mo all, that all of them have to be wrong except one. One's a legitimate one and the rest are bad and evil. So he chose the Gospel of Luke. Okay? The Ebionites, a certain sect of Jewish Christians, chose Matthew. There was a guy named Tatian who was uh, a bit heretical, and he put all the Gospels together into one com combo document called the Diatessaron. All right? Now, here's the way the church has always seen it that the variety of the Gospels is magnificent because the object of Christ's life and work, who he is and what he did, is too big to be taken in by one finite viewpoint, even though it be an inspired, legitimate, uh, you know, fi finite viewpoint. In other words, Matthew, even though he's inspired, could not bear the burden himself of expressing the mystery uh, of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew, but also inspired Luke and also inspired John and Matthew uh, and Mark, that these four were inspired to give us a more comprehensive, broader view of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. There's a legitimate pluralism of different views, different perspectives. They don't conflict, they just enhance each other. Okay, like stereoscopic vision, we have two eyes because we have depth perception that way. Well, with the four Gospels, we have depth perception. In the, I'm showing my age here, but we have quadraphonic sound instead of just you know, one mono sound. We get a richer, deeper vision of who, who Jesus is. Okay? So one of the beautiful things about the conflicts in the four Gospels, the church was, was pretty smart. I mean, the church from the very beginning saw the conflicts in the four Gospels at the level of small details. In Matthew, Jesus rides two uh, uh, um, young mules and donkeys into Jerusalem, and everywhere, everywhere else it's just one. Now, the church from the beginning puts those four Gospels together because that's not, it shows us that's not the, the level of detail, that's not what we need to be looking at, is how many donkeys Jesus rode into Jerusalem. That's not necessary, that's not important. Where these four agree is who Jesus was, what he did, okay? The fundamental meaning of Jesus emerges in, in total agreement in these four Gospels. And the four Gospels show that, to me and to many in the last 2,000 years, it's very clear that when you have four testimonies to the same person in his life, death, and resurrection, his miracles, then you have, you have a greater case. It's a stronger case for, for the reality and legitimacy of this. You know, Jews could not convict anyone 
on the basis of, of anything unless there are at least two testimonies, two witnesses. And, and here we have four witnesses to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Okay, let's talk about the interpretation of these Gospels and all the Scriptures. The different meanings, the different levels of meaning in Scripture, and how it is that we interpret Scripture. I'm going to use a framework that was traditional in the early church. It actually became rather set in the Middle Ages and fell out of favor um, in the last century. It seemed to be just a little bit... Uh, uh, not, not scientific enough, but actually the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church draws our attention to it. And that is the, the, the four senses or the four meanings of Scripture, okay? The four levels of meaning. The first meaning is the literal sense. The second is often called the allegorical sense. The third, the tropological or moral sense. And the fourth, the anagogical sense, all right? You can find this in Catechism number 115 to 118. In De Verbum, you find it in number 12. So let's talk about these four senses. Let's talk about the literal sense first. When we're talking about the literal sense of Scripture, here's what we're talking about. And this is a, a definition that you really need to get clear, and I, in, I encourage you to memorize it. The literal sense is really what the human author intended to teach and what his audience understood. That is the literal sense of Scripture. Okay, so what, what the, the writer of Genesis was trying to teach in the creation stories, that's the literal sense of those creation stories. What the, the, the human author was talking about in the psalm, Psalm 84, how lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord God of hosts. What was he speaking about? My soul is longing and yearning. He's talking about the Jerusalem temple, which no longer exists, and yearning to be there. That was the liter that's a literal sense of that passage. Whatever the author was intending to talk about and his original audience understood. The reason why you have to have the original audience understood is because, you know, you really can't know sometimes what an individual author was thinking about unless you can ask him questions. Today, there are many famous authors where you can ask him questions, him or her, at, you know, after their book is written and get their mind on a certain thing. But you, know, you can't do that with the authors of the past who have passed away. And so one of the ways to understand what they taught is what will, in, in, in the context of the time, uh, what, the, what would the audience have understood based on m the meaning of words at that time, the images of that time? That makes it a little bit more objective. And it makes it a little easier for us to have some idea what the literal sense was. You can't really know literal sense with absolute precision. But historical scholarship can help you reconstruct a period of time and a group of people in their mind frame so that you can put the original words in the context and understand them. And that's the literal sense. And that's the work of scholars. And we're very, very grateful for the last 200 years of tremendous advances in historical scholarship in literary analysis, in the science of philology, which is a study of ancient writings. All these things have helped us tremendously to understand the literal sense better. And that's a wonderful thing. But the goal of interpretation of the literal sense, and this is a goal, you know, it, this may sound very modern, but, you know, the ancients had uh, enough common sense to know that, that there was an effort that needed to be made to try to understand the words in their original context and the events in their original context. So the literal sense isn't something that we're just brand new starting to get at since we have new tools of scholarship. No, the new tools of scholarship just make it easier for us to be better at getting at the literal sense of Scripture. What was, what's the goal of interpreting the literal sense of Scripture? I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a reconstruction of the history of ancient Israel. It's not trying to find the historical Jesus or the community behind the fourth gospel, you know? It's not to go behind the text and use the text to reconstruct some history. That's good work and that's the work of a historian, but that's not the interpretation of Scripture. The interpretation of Scripture looking for the literal sense is looking for the teaching of the inspired author. What is the inspired author teaching about God and about our relationship with Him, about the mystery? That's really what it, the literal sense is about. When you study the Bible for the literal sense, you're studying the Bible as a library. Each book is different. Each passage needs to be understood in its original context. You have to realize there are many different ways of looking at the church. 
or different ecclesiologies than the various New Testament authors. You have to understand there's different Christologies or different ways of explaining who Jesus is, different emphasis based on different authors. So the emphasis is on the humanity of the ancient text, okay, and the differences between one author and another. You also really have to safeguard in the literal sense of Scripture when you're interpreting according to the literal sense, you have to safeguard the permanent religious value of the Old Testament, of the Jewish Scriptures. In the, in the Jewish Scriptures, what did the author have in mind? What, what were they trying to teach? It was valid even though they did not know about the fullness of Christ who was to come. The, the, the academic specialty that studies the literal sense is called biblical exegesis. Okay? Biblical scholars today typically study the literal sense. And I'll tell you what exegesis is. Exegesis, the, here's the, the, the a commonly accepted definition of exegesis. Exegesis is the critical analysis of a portion of Scripture, usually according to the literal sense. Although sometimes people have spoken of spiritual exegesis, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, reading Scripture and, ana and analyzing it according to the spiritual sense. But usually today, exegesis is a critical analysis of the portion of Scripture according to the literal sense, breaking it down, what does it mean in its original context, okay? Now let's talk about the spiritual sense. Really, Scripture has a literal sense and a spiritual sense. Now, that's just two senses. I thought you said there were four. Well, the, there are three phases of the spiritual sense. So if you put the literal sense together with a trifold spiritual sense, you have four senses. All right, let's talk about the spiritual sense. The literal sense is the meaning of the words in their original context. The spiritual sense is a deeper meaning of things, of people, places, and things in the larger context of the whole scriptures, all put together in that big book that we call the Bible or we call the canon. Okay, So in the literal sense, we're looking for what the human author intended to express. He was inspired by God, but we're looking for his conscious expression, what he intended to teach. In the literal sense, we're looking not so much for the human author and what they intended to teach, but we're looking at the bigger picture, what the divine author was intending. Interpreting the Bible according to the same spirit by which it was written. And that's a direct quote from Dei Verbum. Uh, Vatican II, number 11. It's also in the Catechism, number 111. Now, what God was up to, okay, the meaning of David in God's view. God saw that David was a real person, but he, in David, he was crafting for us an image of Christ. He was giving us a, a prelude to what Christ would be, okay? Same thing with Moses. Same thing with Elijah and Elisha. These are all types of or foreshadowings of the person of Christ. Now, God knew that. Elisha didn't necessarily know it, and the, the guy who wrote 2 Kings may not have known it when he's writing about Elijah and Elisha of 1 Kings. So, you, but God knew it. So we're looking at what God intends and, and what God is saying. Okay? And when, we, when we're reading the Scripture and looking for the spiritual sense, we're looking at the Bible not as a library of all sorts of individual different books, we're emphasizing rather a unified book, one book with one author, God. And he's expressing himself, yes, through different human authors, but we're looking at the, at the, at the Bible as a unity, at the divine level of the Bible. Okay? We're, mis we're looking at the Bible as a unified book speaking everywhere of the same topic, and that topic is the mystery of Christ, the whole Christ, Christ and his body, the church. That's what we're looking for. The Old Testament authors didn't necessarily know who Jesus would be, but they were speak, God was speaking through them about him. They were, they were foreshadowing in their words and in their, all the events of the Old Testament, the events of the New Testament, of what Christ was going to do for us, his relationship with the church. Okay? So everywhere we're looking for not just Christ, but especially the mystery of redemption, the incarnation and the paschal mystery of Jesus' death and resurrection. That's really what we're looking for when we're reading the Bible according to the spiritual sense. So usually it's the Old Testament that has a spiritual sense, pointing forward to Christ in the church. But there's also details of the gospel narratives, especially the parables, that can be interpreted allegorically or spiritually in light of Christ's death and resurrection and the incarnation. I'll give you an example of one. 
Okay, here's a, 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 a parable that is being interpreted by St. Augustine according to a spiritual sense. The parable is uttered before Christ dies and is raised from the dead. And, and what Augustine is doing is he's, he's looking at this parable in terms of Christ's incarnation, him coming for us. It's the, the story of the Good Samaritan. So in, in Sermon 171, St. Augustine says this, For the man left lying by the robbers half dead in the road, spurned by the priest and the Levite as they pass by, and taken up by the Samaritan, that man is the whole human race. The one who is immortal and just was far removed from us in our mortality and, and, and sin, but he came down to us so that he, the far distant, might be near at hand to us. Christ is the good Samaritan that takes care of the whole human race. So, so he's looking at this parable in light of the whole mystery of salvation, the incarnation, the redemption. Okay, So there's a spiritual sense that is about Christ everywhere, the whole Christ, God's intent in all that happened, the meaning of things, events. And then there's a literal sense. Okay, They're both related. They can't be opposed. But the spiritual sense goes beyond the literal sense. It exceeds the, the conscious awareness of the human authors. And in the next class, we're going to talk about the three phases or the layers of the spiritual sense, and then we're going to go on and talk about tradition.